know your name, I know you great Yeah, 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 yeah. Control my life, so I put my trust in you. You control my life, I put my trust in you. I know your name, I know your grain. Bad vibes can't even come my way. I'm just tryna serve, God, bring that place. Back in the days, couldn't find my way, but I know you got me. Ain't no love like you and me. So I was blind, but now I see. Why got all this face on me? Good morning, my beautiful brothers and sisters. How are you? Can I get a, uh, fun, some thumbs up if you've had a good week? If your week's been okay, just see in the middle. And if your week's been bad and you need some prayer, okay, we'll speak, we'll speak some bad weeks. But despite the week that we've had, whether it's been good, it's been bad, today is a time where we can pause and reflect on the goodness of the Lord. Amen? Um, I, I do recognize that everyone is unique and we all go through different challenges, ups and downs, um, but Sunday is very unique because it's a time where we're saying we're dedicating this time to the Lord. I know many people are busy working and looking after fa the family and so on. That sometimes during the week it's hard to stop and give God the praise and glory that he alone deserves. But this time is unique. It's not for anyone else but for the Lord. Uh, so I hope that we can pause, we can reflect, we can sing to him. We can hear him speak to us through his sermon, which Rory will preach to us a bit later and we can hear him speak so clearly uh, in his word. Amen? So I want to encourage you, as you've come to church, to have a real high view of who God is. I think a lot of people, without even knowing it, have quite a, a low view of God. Maybe because you, you prayed and he didn't answer your prayer in the way that you like, or you've seen some stuff in the world and you just don't really um, believe in him so much. But I want you to really raise your expectation about who God is and have a really high view of who he is. Um, I was reading um, the scriptures with one of my brothers in Christ this week, and we were reading 1 Timothy chapter 6, and this is Paul writing to Timothy, and look at how he describes the Lord, and I hope that we can do that this morning. So 1 Timothy chapter 6, uh, verse, uh, let me read from verse 15, and he says, which he will display at a proper time, he who is blessed and only sovereign, the king of kings, and the Lord of Lords, who alone has immorality, immortality, who dwells in unapproachable light, who no one has ever seen or will be seen. Amen. To him be honor and glory to eternal dominion. Amen. Amen. So let's just pause for a moment. Um, and let's just close our eyes in reflection. And again, I want you to reflect on your week. Maybe the challenges, and maybe the joys. But despite the challenges and difficulties you might have gone through this week, I, I hope that this morning as your hearts are stilled, you can still see that there is a God. Maybe your challenges has clouded your view of him. I pray that this morning, as we gather to worship him, you will see him clearly through his word, and you will have a right understanding of who God is. So Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. We thank you, Lord, that we get to come into this place freely to worship the King of kings and the Lord of lords, the one who has dominion over all things, the one who is sovereign over all things. Thank you, Lord, that we had the opportunity to breathe again and to walk and to eat and to make our way here. Thank you, Lord. Help us never to take that for granted. And help us with the breath that we have to give you all praise and glory, to bless your holy name. I pray for any barriers, any distractions. I pray they will be put aside so we can see you for who you truly are. But help us to celebrate. Today is not a funeral service. Today is a time to celebrate the resurrected king. So help us to rejoice. Today we're going to be um, honoring and, and having a child's dedication. Help us to honor the life that you've given us, Lord. 
So in everything that, for anything that we do today, Lord, from our singing to hopefully our dancing to the reading of your word, to the notices, to your sermon being preached, I pray that all glory and praise will be given to you. In your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. So I'm going to invite, they're already here behind me, the amazing worship team, and they're going to lead us in sang worship. If you'd like to stand, please let's stand together. Good morning, church. It's a privilege to be here in the house of God this morning. Amen. So as we're here, I just want to encourage you all that um, despite all that we've been through, we serve a great and mighty God. Amen. And in all things, he is still great and greatly to be praised. Hallelujah. So as you worship, just, um, you know, open up your hearts and your minds. Just give him the praise that he deserves. Hallelujah. to worship you, maker of all universe. It's an honor just to stand before you. Just to stand before you with a grateful heart, I lift my hands to you, proclaiming God, you reign. Uh, with a grateful heart, I lift my hands to you, proclaiming God, you reign. Great to be, Father God, you are Father, 
Great are you, Lord. Great are you, Lord. Great are you, Lord. Sing great are you, great are you, Lord. Yes, we say. Oh, 
great is our God. You're the name of all our One last time, how great is our God? See, how great is our God? Sing me how great is our God? We all will see how great, just how great is our God. Amen. Church, just for a few moments, um, because we have a really busy service, but I just want us just to greet the person to our left and to our right, or we can actually get out our pews and actually go and say hello to someone we don't know. You don't know what kind of week people have had, so just saying God bless you will go a long way. So let's just do that for a few moments uh, to get through. So if you're a member of this church, I want to remind you that on the 8th of September, we have our membership meeting, so if you're a member here, um, it's really important that you come along to these meetings as we basically have a, a family meeting just to talk about things happening in the life of the church and the things that we are seeking to do. So it'll be great for you uh, to come. Baptism. Hands up if you've been baptized before. Quite a lot of people. Hands up if it was an amazing experience to, to give your life to Christ in that way. Amen. Amen. And so for all the people who haven't been baptized, it's your opportunity to um, have a public declaration that you are a follower of Jesus Christ. And we have baptism classes coming up, um, but before we do that, we just want to get at the number of people who want to get baptized. So there's some um, sheets at the back of the church where you can put your name down, and soon um, we're going to have baptism classes. But if you want to know more about baptism, what it means, uh, please speak to either myself or Dapo, if you could just give us a wave, and we'll be able to tell you um, more about what baptism looks like. Right, what's happening after church? Just shout to me. Sports day. Are you guys ready for sports day? Are all the men who think they're faster than me ready as well? Good, Simon. Simon's ready. I think I have a chance of winning this, this one then. Uh, hopefully some of the other men are not around. That would be good for, for a better chance. But we have sports day right after the service and we'll be meeting at uh, 1.30 at Wilford Road Recreation Ground. If you don't know where it is, just follow a group of people who are walking. Hopefully it's church people and not random people. Um, but we, we'll be making our way there. But if you're not um, interested in, in participating in, in any sports, we're basically having a church picnic. Uh, so please do come along. There are some sandwiches and other bits and bobs that are going to be provided. So, so please do come along. Even if you're, um, you're not thinking of actually participating in any sports, um, you can come along for the picnic. Cool? Cool? Awesome. Painting day. I just want to give just a big thank you to everyone who came yesterday. We were here from about 11 to about 6, um, painting hall 1, and there's still some work to go. Um, so if you're free this Tuesday at 6.30, uh, please do come to church with some old clothes, and we're going to continue uh, to paint the church. This is the way that we serve our, our, our house. This is the, the building that God has entrusted to us, and it's important that we look after it. Amen? Awesome. Now, WhatsApp. Hands up if you have WhatsApp. Awesome. So one of the, the ways that we're trying to communicate to everyone, I realize that sometimes it's not easy to communicate to everyone so quickly. So we are starting a WhatsApp group, which will be managed by the admin. So it's not a group that you can just post anything in or any random stuff in there. Um, but it's going to be there for announcement and information. And so if you want to um, join this WhatsApp group, please just scan the QR code. 
um, and it will take you straight into um, the WhatsApp group. But if you're not as technical as that, you can speak to Swaley or Rebecca. Can you stand up, Swaley and Rebecca? And they'll be able to, um, yeah, just stand up so they see you. <laughs> I like to embarrass them more. Um, and yeah, give them your numbers and they'll be able to put you in the group. Awesome, but yeah, feel free to scan the QR code and you'll go straight in. Sisterhood, you want me to do the announcement, Sisterhood? Sisterhood, ladies in the house. Awesome, this is a group that I am quite jealous of. I feel like as men, we're not as good as the sisters yet, but we're getting there. But Sisterhood is continuing their Genesis theme. Um, so I believe the next um, chapter is Genesis chapter six. And apparently they have an amazing world-class speaker as a guest who's going to be sharing on the six. So if you really wanna know who this world-class preacher is, I heard he's really, really good. Um, Eden approves as well. Um, yeah, please do come along on the 7th of September at 10.30 at the church. And this is only for our sisters in the house. Amen? Awesome. I believe that's it for my notices. Awesome. So we have a, a really special moment in our service. We have a baby dedication. Can we have a round of applause? This is for baby Kyrie, and just before we um, share this baby dedication, it was just something I was thinking about this morning. I woke up, because Eden woke me up really early, uh, so you just have time to think and reflect, and I was thinking about uh, baby Kyrie. I had an opportunity to hold him yesterday, such a handsome, there he is, such a handsome little boy, and, and it just got me thinking of how many baby, baby dedications we've had or churches have had of particularly young men and women, but particularly young men, and still some of these young men grow and end up in prison. Like, like how is it that we've, we've had so many baby dedications, so many male baby dedications, and yet when I go to, to prison on a, Monday, on a Monday afternoon, I see a lot of these young men who say they, they were dedicated in the church, but for some reason they've, they've ended up in, in prison. And I feel like sometimes we take baby dedications for granted. We see a lovely, handsome baby, and we just say a couple of words, and we welcome the family into the church. But I really want us, I'm, I'm speaking, speaking to Jacqueline and also to Kirk as well, and the family, and to all of us in this room, to really take it seriously about how we raise our children in the Lord. Um, that take this day really seriously. You're dedicating your child to the Lord, but, but what a waste it will be to dedicate your child to the Lord and yet not invest in his life spiritually. And so I really believe it's key. We, if you live in Croydon, you will see the, the rate of how many young men and women are just wasting their lives. And a lot of them were, came from the church. And some of their parents still go to the church. And so there needs to be a big investment, not just with the parents, but with all of us here today. If we see one of our sisters or, or our brothers in the Lord struggling with raising their kids, let's, let's invest and let's support them, let's pray for them, let's encourage them. It, it's a hard work, but I believe that the Lord has given us the Holy Spirit, and with the Holy Spirit, nothing is impossible. Amen? Um, so today is special. We're, we're going to dedicate a young boy to the Lord, but it's not just this day. We want to continue to invest in his life. I want you to be a part of this family's life. Amen? So I'm going to invite Jacqueline and Kirk and the family. They have a really big family, so hopefully they all fit on the stage. But I'm going to invite them up. Let's just give them a round of applause as they come up. <laughs> family, don't be shy. Come, come, come. I told you it was a big family. Still, still someone who was sitting there. <laughs> oh, we're good. We're good for now. <laughs> awesome. So let me remind us that children are a heritage from the Lord an offering of a great reward, like a warrior in the hands of a warrior, are children born in one's youth. 
Blessed is the man whose quiver is full of them. They will not be put to shame when they are contended with their opponents in court. Amen. Amen. Children are indeed a blessing. And Jacqueline and Kirk are here to present their child before the Lord. So Jacqueline and Kirk are here to present their child before the Lord as Jesus was presented in the temple by his parents. In doing so, they recognize that their child is not their personal property, but belongs also to God. And that as parents, they, they will have the responsibilities before God. In their promises, they will commit themselves to their full responsibilities before the Lord Jesus. So I'm going to invite um, Kirk and Jacqueline to say some words after me. Um, after these words, just please say, uh, we do. So Jacqueline and Kirk, do you thank God for his gift of your child? And do you accept the joys and duties of parenthood, promising to give love and care to your child? We do. Let's say it again. We, we do. do. Awesome. And do you promise to bring your son up within the Christian community and to share your own faith with him? We, we do. do. Awesome. And what names have you given to your son? I don't know who wants to. Kyrie, Desmond, Horace, Oliver, Jones. Wow. <laughs> Amazing. And out of the 50 names that you've got, are there any significant ones that you want to share? Um, well, yeah, the two. Desmond is from my... Sorry. Um, my grandma, who passed away, I found out I was pregnant three days after she passed away with him. And her name was Desiree, and she was Guyanese. So Desmond from the program, Guyanese. So that's why we gave him that. And then Horace is um, Kirk's late uncle. Thank you. God bless you. Do you have godparents? I know you do. I do, yeah. Godparents, can you? Yeah. Charlotte? One's on his way, hopefully he makes it, but if not, he can still continue his duties. So God, parents, I have some words uh, for you too, and please just say the same words we do. So do you promise to be a positive role model, promising to pray for Kiari, care for him, and when needed, show him the way of Christ? We do. We do. A bit louder? Yes, we do. Amen. And can everyone please stand up? And I've got some promises for you too. And if you can also say, we do, if you really believe. But again, think about the words um, that I'm sharing with you all today. Do you promise to offer Kyrie, his family, your love and care, and join with the parents in sharing the Christian community? We do. We do. A bit louder? We do. So when you see him, I know, I know he's going to be a, a wonderful child, but if you see him in Croydon and he's being a bit chatty, being a bit naughty, you can tell him, look, you are a child of God. Amen? Please be seated. Are you able to hold the mic one second? I just make it. Thank you. Isn't he handsome? Church, let's reach your hands towards him. I'm going to just... Give him a blessing, and then we're going to pray for him. So Kyrie, Desmond, Horace, Oliver, Jones, we dedicate you to the Lord now. And we ask that the Lord will bless you and keep you. I pray that the Lord will make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. I pray that the Lord will lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Amen. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this young man. I thank you, Lord, that he's on this earth already for a reason. I thank you, Lord, for his parents, J. Kaylin and Kirk. I thank you for his brother, Khalil. I thank you for this beautiful family. And I pray, Lord Jesus, that you will give them the strength the wisdom, the joy, the peace in parenting this young man. That anywhere they feel like they're lacking, Lord, you will restore to them. You will give them insight and wisdom through your word 
to raise up their child in the things of the Lord so that when he's older, he will not depart from it. But Lord, as I hold this young man, I pray that he will never depart from you. I pray, Lord, that you will set him apart for your glory, that everything that he does, from when he speaks, when he walks, when he goes to school, when he meets friends, when he eventually goes to uni, if that's his will, if all the things that he does to his job, to his wife, his children, everything will be done to give you glory. Lord, the greatest gift that you have given us is salvation. And I pray that he will know this at a young age. Lord, that you will protect him, Lord. We see how the enemy is ruining, ruining the lives of young men in Croydon and beyond. We just pray that would not be the case for this young man. That his life would be protected. His uncles, his aunties, his grandparents would be there and his church family would be there to support him. Help us as a church never to neglect the children in our care, but give us wisdom to raise them up in the things of the Lord. So we thank you for this blessing. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Um, DJ Crew, do you have any music just to play? I just want to take uh, Kari, Kiari, is it Kiari? Kyrie, Kyrie around the church so people can see how handsome this man is. Cool? Can we give them a round of applause? Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. No Awesome. Just before we come to the preaching of God's word, um, so the children will be staying in the service as the month of August. We're just taking a time of, of rest for the Sunday school teachers because they work really hard. But I believe the youth are going upstairs. So if you're from the ages of 11 to 17, please do follow Rebecca uh, to the upper room. And also just to let you know that crash. So if you're a baby, if you have a little baby, um, your, the crash is also available. And so if you would like to go to the crash, we do have the service that is live streamed in the crash and there's loads of toys and activities for your child that is also available um, at any point. Please do follow this amazing, beautiful woman over here called Jemima. And as they're going, I'm going to invite Nelda and she's going to come and read for us. And she'll be reading from Psalm 51. So if you have your Bibles, let's get it ready. Psalm 51. We're continuing our psalm series, and uh, we've got two more psalms to go, and then we're going back to John. So I'm just going to invite Nelda. Let's say amen when we get there. All the words are on the screen. Here we go. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only, have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, you delight in truth in the inward being, and you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. 
Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will return to you. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, O God of my salvation, and my tongue will sing aloud of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips and my mouth will declare your praise. For you will not delight in sacrifice or I would give it. You will not be pleased with a burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. O oh God, you will not despise. Do good to Zion in your good pleasure. Build up the walls of Jerusalem. Then you will delight in sacrifices, in burnt offerings, sorry, in burnt offerings and whole burnt offerings. Then bulls will be offered on your altar. Here ends the reading of God's word. Thank you. Thank you, Nelda, for that beautiful reading. I'm going to invite Rory to come and bring God's word to us. Before he does that, let's, let's pray for him. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your faithful servant, Rory Lord. I thank you for just for his love to your church for so many years, but most importantly, his, his love for you, Lord. And thank you, Lord, that he's had time just to pause and to reflect on your word in Psalm 51. And Lord, he's about to share what that word, uh, how it's communicated to us today, Lord. Uh, so, Lord, I just pray that you will speak through your servant, use him boldly. And I pray, Lord, you will give us the hearts to hear this word. But not just hear the words, Lord, but help us to become doers of your word this day. So have your way in this service. In your name, Jesus. Amen. Carrying on with our series of uh, the summer in the Psalms, um, covers for August before we return to John's Gospel. And uh, <clears throat> two, week, two weeks ago, Denzel spoke to us from uh, Psalm 19, which was a great, great psalm, heralding how God has manifested to us through creation and through his word. And last, last week, David spoke to us about from Psalm 103, about the very many reasons why we can and why we should praise the Lord. And Denzel encouraged right to start to have a high view of God, a high view of God. Well, today, we're going to look at the corollary of that when, when you've, your high view of God drops. What are the consequences of that? One of the, the verses towards the end of the psalm, which Denzel read, read to us, about sort of the greatness of God, the creation of God and, and, and his word. He says, keep back your servant from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. <clears throat> we will find out how David found out about that the hard way. How his sins did have dominion over him for a while. And how, how he had to find restoration with, with God. So whilst we may look to this high God, whilst we may pray him, Praise to him and pray him to him. Let us not forget that we can fall too. Let us not forget our human side. So David was a man full, supposed to be a man, a man of God's own heart, a man who trusted God to, to, to defeat Goliath in the various battles. In, when King Saul was, was attacking him, he trusted God. He was a mature man of faith, and yet he fell. He fell from grace. So when we are mature in faith, let, let us not think that, that we're not vulnerable to something like this too. So let, let us open up the word. It's Psalm 51. And I just want to concentrate on the first two verses, first of all. What I call the headlines. Yeah. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. 
I want to first focus on David's the headlines of what he's done wrong. He said, cleanse me from my sin, blot out my transgressions, wash me from my iniquity. Now, David touched on this last week. Sin. Sin is God's measure. God is perfect. And we are all sinful. We all fall. In general ways, in particular ways, we all fall beyond God's, God's, God's standard. So we all need forgiveness from general sin. Transgression. He seems to have David described as crossing a line. Now those of you who are drivers, you're driving along, and there's a green traffic light ahead, and you're getting closer, and it turns to amber. Can you get across in time? Do you, do you slow down? Do you put on the brakes? Think, oh, I can get across. How many times have you done it? Oh, it's gone red, I'm crossing on red. You've crossed the line. You've done wrong. You should have stopped. A transgression might be an instant decision, and you've done it wrong. You know, it may be, maybe there's one last chocolate brownie in the biscuit tin, and it's promised for someone else. And you think, oh, I will eat it. You've crossed the line. It may, it may be that um, you've had a row with your partner or your parents and you realise, no, I'm, I'm in the wrong there. I, I, I said something I shouldn't. You've crossed the line. But it was a one-off. Then we come to iniquity. Iniquity is a bit different. This is a presumptuous sin. This is a long-term sin. This is where you've taken a decision to do the wrong thing and you persist in doing that wrong thing for a long time. This is a different level. So David refers to his sin, his transgressions, and his iniquity. But he also looks upward. He always looks up to God. He looks to God's characteristics. According to your steadfast love, According to your abundant mercy. David was a man of experience of God. He knew God's character. He knew about God's love, how God had helped him in the past. He knew God was a merciful God. He knew he had to come back to God. Now those first two verses, those headlines, don't really tell us about what the backstory was. And I want to canter through to Samuel. 2 Samuel chapters 11 and the beginning of 12. For those of you who've got your Bibles, you might want to turn to 2 Samuel 11. And um, <clears throat> from the beginning of that, I think it may be on the screen, but I, sh I shall read it out and we'll hear how David went wrong. In the spring of the year, the time when kings go out to battle, David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel, and they ravaged the Ammonites and besieged Rabbath. But David remained in Jerusalem. He was idle. It happened late one afternoon when David arose from his couch and was walking on the roof of the king's house that he saw from the roof a woman bathing. And the woman was very beautiful. And David sensed and inquired about the woman. And one said, Is this not the Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? So David sent messengers and took her, and she came to him, and he lay with her. Then she returned to her house, and the woman conceived. And she sent and told David, I am pregnant. So this man of God, he fell into temptation. He didn't resist the temptation. The temptation led to adultery. And now the woman is pregnant. We read on. So David sent word to Joab, send me Uriah the Hittite. And Joab sent Uriah to David. When Uriah came to him, David asked, how Joab was doing, and how the people were doing, and how the war was going. Then David said to Uriah, go down to your house and wash your feet. And Uriah went out of the king's house. And there followed 
him a present from the king. But Uriah slept at the door of the king's house with all the servants of the Lord and did not go down to his house. When they told David, Uriah did not go down to his house, David said to Uriah, have you not come from a journey? Why did you not go down to your house? And Uriah said to David, the ark and Israel and Judah dwells in booths, and my lord Joab and the servants of my lord are camping in the open fields. Shall I then go to my house and eat and drink and lie with my wife? As you live and as your soul lives, I will not do this thing. Then David said to Uriah, Remain here today and also tomorrow, and I will send you back. So Uriah remained in Jerusalem that day and the next. And David invited him, and he ate in his presence, and he drank, so that he made him drunk. And in the evening he went out to lie on his couch with the servants of his lord. But he did not go down to his house. So the process starts with temptation. It led to adultery. And now we have plots to cover up, a conspiracy to cover up. Didn't work the first time, so he tried to make him drunk. Didn't work the second time. Now where does it go? In the morning, David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it by the hand of Uriah. In the letter he wrote, set Uriah in the forefront of the hardest fighting and then draw back from him that he may be struck down and die. And as Joab was besieging the city, he assigned Uriah to the place where he knew there were valiant men. And the men of that city came out and fought with Joab and some of the servants of David. And among the people fell. Uriah the Hittite also died. Started off with temptation, led to adultery, led to a cover-up. Now it's led to murder. the end of the chapter it said when the wife of Uriah heard that Uriah her husband was dead she lamented over her husband and when the morning was over David sent and brought her to his house and she became his wife and bore him a son and then the final word of the chapter but the thing that David done, had done displeased the Lord that's an understatement, but the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. Now David was, he was king. And in those days, the king had absolute authority. Head of the church, head of the government, head of the monarchy. No one could tell the king what to do. So how, how did the Lord get David's attention? Well, he, he sent a prophet. So at the start, 2 Samuel 12, we have Nathan the prophet, and he tells David a story. And the Lord sent Nathan to David. He came to him and said to him, there were two men in a certain city, one rich and the other poor. The rich man had very many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing but one little ewe lamb, which he had bought. And he brought it up, and it grew with him and with his children. It used to eat his morsel and drink from his cup and lie in his arms, and it was like a daughter to him. Now there came a traveller to the rich man, and he was unwilling to take one of his own flock or herd to prepare for the guest who had come to him. But he took the poor man's lamb and prepared it for the man who had come to him. Then David's anger was greatly kindled against the man. And he said to Nathan, As the Lord lives, the man who has done this deserves to die. And he shall restore the lamb fourfold, because he did this thing, and because he had no pity. Then Nathan said to David, You are the man. Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I anointed you king over Israel. And I delivered you out of the hand of Saul. And I gave you your master's house and your master's wives into your arms and gave you the house of Israel and of Judah. And if this were not if it were too little, I would have given you much more. 
Why have you despised the word of the Lord to do what is evil in this sight? You have struck down Uriah the Hittite with a sword and have taken his wife to be yours. You've killed him with the sword of the Ammonites. We leave it there. But now we see the backstory. The first thing I want you to, to note is the time scales. Whilst Psalm 51 is David's psalm of confession, his psalm, the prayer of repentance, this, this did not happen overnight. David was in the wrong place for a long time. You know, we read on that the baby was born and the baby died. The baby, David had to bear the consequences of his sin. And that's true in society today. If we break the law, we, the law judges us. We bear the consequences of our sin. And it took David a long time to come back to his senses. This mighty man of God, who had known God's protection and known God's blessing, was still capable of falling. How is that so? How is that so? Let's get back to our psalm. Psalm 51. Let me quickly go through certain things. Verses 3 to 6. This is David's acknowledgement of his sin. This is his confession. And now we know what those sins and the iniquity is. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, you delight in truth in the inward being, and you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. So David says, first of all, I know my transgressions and my sin are ever before me and ever before you. But he's now being totally open, totally honest with the Lord. There's no cover-up now. There's no self-justification. There's no reasoning to try and pretend what he did wasn't as bad as it really was. There's an open acknowledgement of his sin. My sin is ever before me. Against you, you only have I sinned. Well, that's not quite true. You know, he sinned against Bathsheba. He sinned against Uriah. But, and he trusts in God's judgment so that you may be justified in your words. He realises God's judgment and justice is true and that he's been found out, but he's open to God's judgment. He says that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. He knows that God's judgment is true and he has been found out and he's not making any pretense on that. In verse 6, here's the heart of the matter. Behold, you delight in truth in the inward being, and you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. David would not be able to confess and seek restoration unless he recognised the truth that was in his heart, and he was going to change that truth to one where he could openly acknowledge God again and say, I've messed up big time. So verses 3 to 6 are the acknowledgement and the confession. Verses 7 to 12 are the prayer for forgiveness and restoration. So we read on. Purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. 
Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins. Blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence. Take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with a willing spirit. David recognises he needs to be cleansed. He recognises he needs to be forgiven. So we have the images of cleansing with hyssop, washing to be whiter than snow. And as these verses go on, we, we get to understand some of the uh, consequences of living in a sin, in a hidden sin, in a concealed sin, for quite some time. He says, let me hear the joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. The weight of guilt and uh, lack, lack of joy had been affecting him. He had the sinking feeling that he'd been wrong, that he'd been hiding something. And the joy that he had in the Lord had departed. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. This is a key verse, verse 10. This is what it's all about. Create in me a clean heart. It has to have a new start. A clean heart. One where you can openly acknowledge God. And renew a right spirit within me. So having had a clean heart, the right spirit, so we can continue in the Lord, so we can continue to be strong, and he will not fall into temptation again. And whilst he was away from the Lord, he said, cast me not away from your presence and take your Holy Spirit from me. He hadn't enjoyed God's presence with him whilst all this had been going on. Verse 11, cast me not away from your presence. Take not away your Holy Spirit. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. You see, he had lost his joy and he needed to find his joy again. The burden of guilt, after he'd been away, was taking its toll. He secretly, he knew he was living a life of deceit, a deceit of cover-up. But he was the king. He could get away with it. Who was going to tell him off? He'd enjoyed God's blessing in the past. God put him where he is. For a while, he thought he could get away with it. Next two sections. These are the results. First, the results on a personal level, then the results on a society level. So, 13 to 17. This is, if David is forgiven, what he will do. 13 to 17. Then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners will return to you. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, O God of my salvation and my tongue will sing aloud of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise. For you will not delight in sacrifice, or I will give it. You will not be pleased with a burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. O God, you will not despise. David recalls the joy he had in the Lord early on, when he spoke and praised the Lord, when he praised the Lord with all his might. And he was a good witness, and the people of Israel followed him. And he recognises that if God restores his joy, if God forgives him, then he will be able to teach transgressors your ways. But he needs to be delivered from his blood guiltiness. And then he says... I, my tongue will sing of your salvation. 
My tongue will sing aloud of your righteousness. My mouth will declare your praise. He knows that if he's restored, he will be able to witness and be God's man again. But God has to restore him. And another moment of honesty here. For you will not delight in sacrifice, or I would give it. You will not be pleased with a burnt offering. Now we know from the Old Testament that they were full of sacrifices and burnt offering. But David realises for his particular sin, this iniquity, that the deeper transformation is needed. Needed in David himself. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit. A broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. David's own spirit, his own selfishness, needs to be broken before God. He needs to be fully broken, fully repentant, so he could be restored. And he knows that if he's truly open, truly honest, truly broken, that God will restore him. And finally, the last, last couple of verses are the consequences, the results for society. David's king. He says, do good to Zion in your good pleasure. Build up the walls of Jerusalem. Then you will delight in right sacrifices, in burnt offerings, in holding burnt offerings, and bulls will be offered on your altar. Now, there's not an inconsistency here between the communal sacrificing of bulls and burnt offering. This, this is what the commandments the Old Testament wanted to happen in around the temple. It's part of the worship of the, of the God in Old Testament times. But going back into verse 16, you will not be pleased with the burnt offering. This, this is personal. This is for David himself. He knows he needs, he can't sacrifice a bull and then be all right with God and pretend nothing else has happened inside his own heart. He needs to be changed inward himself. So those are not consistent. But David, having looked at how he would change himself for himself and how he would witness, then looks at how he would work in the wider society. I want to pause there just to reflect on, could, could this happen today? Is this just a story in the Old Testament? A story to, to teach us. Are there any modern day examples? Now David was the supreme ruler. He was king. And back in those days, the king was head of the church, head of the army, head of the government. He was completely sovereign. Not so today. We have a, we have a constitutional monarch. Our late queen, Queen Elizabeth, was a great witness. Remember her Christmas messages? Always witnessing to Jesus and her relationship there. And our king has made a good start, but you don't have to look too far amongst the other royals to find elements of scandal. But I'm not going to go there. David was ruler of the government, and today the government is ruled by, by our politicians. And you probably don't have to think too hard to think where there's been scandal amongst our politicians. But I don't want to go there either. In today's society, the high profile people are also our celebrities and our media personalities. And I do want to do a comparison, reflection on one of our media stalwarts that has fallen from grace. Now, people of my generation, and not just my generation, probably have had a, quite a love for the BBC. You know, the younger people, you may not have heard of someone called Hugh Edwards. Hugh Edwards has had a stellar career in the, in the BBC. He was a journalist. He was a newscaster. He rose to become the anchor man of the BBC. This, the main programme, News at 10. He was the main presenter. He was the highest paid presenter. News at 10. He was Mr. Trustworthy, Mr. Reliable. And when it came to big state occasions, the funeral of Prince Philip, 
the funeral of our late queen, the coronation of the king. Hugh Edwards was trusted to present the programme for the BBC. He was Mr Reliable, Mr Faithful. And he was a man of God too. He presented songs of praise. He spoke, um, he, he led a documentary on the Welsh Revival. And yet he's had a very public fall from grace. This was a happy family man, married, five children. And now, now his uh, stories are his of separation from his wife. Humiliation for the children. Remember the words of Denzel. We've got to look after our children. Church, we've got to look after our marriages. If our marriages fall apart, the children are affected too. We've got to look after our children. We've got to look after our marriages. Hugh Edwards was, has been found guilty. I'm not going to go into the details of it, but he had him images on his phone, which he shouldn't have had. And this was repeated in the three charges. He appeared in court. He didn't say much. What he did say was guilty. So is the restoration for Hugh Edwards, like there was for David? Will he appear on the BBC, on the media again? I think not. Society probably won't forgive him. He was treasured back in Wales. You know, local boy, made good. Now the plaque in his hometown is defaced. Will society forgive him? Probably not. Will God forgive him? Well, God forgave King David for all his sins. Forgiveness is available for Hugh Edwards. Will he take it? Well, that's the matter between Hugh and God. I don't know, but we can pray for him. We will pray for him. So, as we draw to a close, there's a few lessons I want to draw from this. First, to be aware of two wrong attitudes. Two wrong attitudes. First one is self-justification. Now, David, as king, he could have looked around at all the other kings and all the other kingdoms and seen what they do. And it's probably an awful lot worse than that. The king took what the king wanted. The king set the law. If the king did it, it was not wrong. David could have pointed to other things. Well, others do it. And sometimes when we mess up, we think, oh, well, other people do it. You know, others do it worse than me. Therefore, I'm okay. No, it doesn't work that way. It's not against God's standards. David's predecessor was King Saul. And Saul tried to justify himself when he went against what the Lord had commanded him. He says, oh, well, Sam, Samuel's taking rather a long time to turn up, and these, these people are getting a bit restless. I think I'll, I'll do what, um, um, what he asked me not to do. It seems like a good idea. Nothing wrong with that, is there? Well, Samuel, Saul was not wholly devoted to the Lord. He didn't wholly repent in the way that David did. He did try self-justification. So self-justification is not the way. The second wrong attitude is cover-up. Deceit. And to some extent, society <coughs> recognises that. You know, if you get away with it, you got away with it. And the sin is being caught. Now, is the sin being caught? Is the sin being found out? No, the sin is the sin, is the sin, full stop. The cover-up is just the deceit. Just the deceit. You're fooling yourself. One of the Psalms I was reading recently. It 
Psalm 94, it says, Understand, O dullest of people, fools, when will he be wise? He who planted the ear, does he not hear? He who formed the eye, does he not see? He who disciplines the nations, does he not rebuke? He who teaches man knowledge, the Lord knows the thoughts of man. You might fool some of the people with your colour cover up. You're not going to fool God. God knows it all. He sees what you do. He hears what you say. He knows the thoughts of your mind. He sees the actions when you follow through, when you don't repent. So, avoid self-justification. Avoid cover-up. What should we do? Second point, beware of temptation. Stay strong in the Lord. In David's case, it all started when? It said, well, in the springtime, when the kings go off to war, he stayed at home. If you're idle, the devil will find work for your hands. David wasn't in the right place at the right time. He should have been engaged in the battles, set up the kingdom, his kingdom. He stayed behind. He fell into temptation. Stay strong in the Lord. Temptation is out there. Whether you're old or whether you're young, and the temptations will be different from each of us. We have each of different weaknesses. Do not think that you're so strong that you're invulnerable to temptation. Temptation may come. It will come across your way, but what will you do with it? Can you say no to it? Part of the answer is to stay strong in the Lord. Focus not on the subject of the temptation. Focus on the Lord. Read the scriptures. Stay strong in the Lord. In 1 Corinthians 10, it says, Therefore let anyone who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. No temptation has overtaken you. That is not common to man. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he will also provide a way of escape that you may be able to endure it. Church, God will provide a, temp a way out. That may, way may be different in different respects. He may bring someone alongside you, wise counsel. But the scriptures are there. Stay strong in the Lord if you're tempted. Should I do this? Check against the book. Get the measure. And if it's wrong, go away. In terms of sexual temptation, he says, flee from sexual immorality. Don't think about it. Don't weigh it up. Don't weigh out the pros and cons. Run from it. Run to the word. So the third general point, so beware of the two wrong attitudes, self-justification and cover-up. Beware of temptation to stay strong in the Lord. And finally, when we fail, when we fail, confess and repent. David did, Hugh Edwards can. We can when we mess up. But will we? Some of the key scriptures that we talked about, verse 6. We desire the truth within us. The way it works. <coughs> Until we acknowledge the truth within us, we will not be able to fully repent. And until we fully repent, we will not be able to receive the forgiveness that God offers. It starts with the truth. Acknowledge the truth within you. Then you will be able to repent. 
And once you've been repenting, truly repenting, then you can receive the forgiveness that God is prepared to give you. So let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the truth that is within your scriptures. How we can learn from history. How we can learn from the teaching. How we can learn from the stories. How we can learn from when things have gone wrong. And how we can learn from when they are corrected. Lord, through the eyes of the New Testament, we can see that all sins can be forgiven through the blood of Jesus. That he is the one that enables us to be restored and forgiven. But Lord, in our lives, wherever we are, may we have the courage to recognize the truth when we are wrong. May we have the courage to, to repent when we recognize that truth. And may we have sort of the grace and the courage to ask for the forgiveness that you offer so freely when we mess up. Amen. We are now going to be moving to our communion. So if our servers would like to, to come forward, whilst we uh, prepare for that. In some ways, the, uh, <coughs> our act of communion follows quite well from the, uh, the sermon, from the, the subject of uh, discourse today. So it's through the communion where we remember the broken body of Jesus, when we remember the outpoured blood, when we remember the heart of the gospel message that is given in the New Testament, that's when we are truly forgiven. And we need to recognize that we are all sinners, that we've all sinned in one way or another over time by God's standard and we all have need of that forgiveness and by coming to Jesus by coming in prayer by coming in repentance and remembering what he has done for us we can be we can be forgiven we should be wary of idolatry idolatry is trying to put something else alongside God, something else instead or alongside. We can't have God plus something else. In 1 Corinthians said, flee from idolatry. I speak as the sensible people. Judge for yourselves what I say. The cup of blessing that we bless, is it not the participation in the blood of Christ? The bread that we break is it not our participation in the body of Christ? Because there is one bread, we who are many, one body, for we all partake of the one bread. We're going to be coming to the act of communion. And our practice this time will be to take the, the, the bread will be distributed individually and we will take that together and then separately the wine will be brought round and we will hold on to that and we will drink together. Bread represents the body of Jesus. In small pieces, the body was broken for us. We take that individually as we receive it in 
recognition of our individual sins and we can remember what God has done for us through Jesus. We hold on to the wine together because we are one body, we are one church and we will drink that together. Before we do, I'll just quickly read the familiar passage from 1 Corinthians 11. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup, is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let us pray before we take the elements. Lord, we, we thank you, thank you deeply for this sacrament we thank you that we have the opportunity to remember you to remember what you did for us to remember your broken body to remember your outpoured blood as an atonement for our sin so our sin can be taken away that we can be washed clean that we can be restored. And you set this up as a sacrament, that we should do it regularly, and that we should remember you. So Lord, as we come to take the bread, as we come to take the wine, may we do this in sincerity, in recognition of what we have done wrong, and in recognition of all that you have done for us. Help us to draw close to you now, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We will now take, take the bread.
Lord, may he be able to for find forgiveness in you. And Lord, for everyone here, you know, Lord, the lives of each of us. You know where there has been cover-up. You know where there's been deceit. You know where there's been sin. We cannot hide it from you. But Lord, for each and every one of us here, Lord, I pray, may there be restoration. May there be acknowledgement of truth. May there be true repentance. And may there be forgiveness and a restoration and new life in you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, Rory, for, for your word to us and for leading us in communion. Uh, we're going to continue to worship the Lord today, so I want to invite uh, Stephen and the worship team to lead us in our last song. And during this time, we're going to also worship the Lord with our offerings. Thank you. Shall we all rise as we sing the last song, creating me a clean heart.
Amen. 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 Please be seated, church. We have finished service, and I just want to say, um, I know with the family, we have a, a lot of newcomers here today, but if anyone is here for the very first time, um, can you just wave at me? We just want to just welcome you into the life for the church. I know, again, the family here, you're new, uh, but anyone here for the first time, just wave. Church, can we give them a nice welcome? Bless you. Um, you're more than happy to join us on our sports day, so don't forget, right after the service, just do your stretches. We don't want anyone pulling any muscles. Um, we're going to meet at the Wilfred, I think, um, uh, recreation ground, which is not too far from here. But if you have no idea where you're going, just um, hang around, and uh, we're all going to go together. And again, it's, um, if you're not sporty, it's fine. Um, it's a little bit annoying because I know um, Jamil and uh, Jason have just arrived. They're the two fastest guys of the church. I thought they weren't here. But hey, I might, not, I might not compete, but we'll see. But if you're, if you're here and you don't want to uh, race or be part of the uh, sports day, uh, feel free just to come along. We're going to have a church picnic, so it's a great time for us to fellowship together. So church, let's stand to share the benediction. I believe the words are on the screen. Um, you can face one another. You can say it to yourselves however you want to, but let's, let's share this together. So may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all now and forevermore. Amen. Amen. I pray you have a blessed week, and we do have teas and coffees at the back, so feel free to mingle and fellowship. God bless you. Gracious to you.